Barbara Lee Diamondstein. Welcome to Visions and Images, American Photographers on Photography. Today we'll be talking to Frederick Summer. For a long while, 75-year-old Frederick Summer has been far from the main marketplace of New York, and yet he is at the heart of photography. Born in Italy, raised in Brazil, he received his training as a landscape architect at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. For more than 45 years now, he has made his home in Prescott, Arizona, where he has devoted himself to photography, painting and drawing, musical composition, and self-discovery. For Frederick Summer, the world of art is the world of ideas. A very warm welcome to you, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. You've sought meaning in every aspect of your life. In addition to photography, your eclectic interests include landscape architecture, painting, music, science, and philosophy. How have you managed to forge such a unified sensibility out of such diverse subject matter and, me and media? The hard thing to go to, through life is to have chosen one path and to stick to it. And it might have been the wrong choice. But you see, since I never made the choice, I have never ran the risk, you see, of having made the wrong choice. I go from one thing to another as it, as it interests me. Well, how and where did your interest in the uh, natural environment awaken? Well, that wasn't so very hard in, in uh, for instance, uh, living in, in Rio, uh, in Brazil, uh, and, and, uh, at, at literally at the edge of the jungle, uh, beautiful forests all around it. And uh, I really uh, got an interest in these things. And, and so it was, it was easy. Yeah, that's easy. The exotic is easy to come by. About 50 years ago, you suffered a physical collapse that you learned to deal with, and at least philosophically, and began a new phase of your life and your education, and that was the study of philosophy and art. When was the first time that you considered photography and what the artist as photographer might do? I had been uh, interested in, in uh and photography because of the uses, you know, to which it can so easily be put. And uh, everyone has done this at one point very early, uh, you know. Young people at the age of 14, 16, get hold of a camera and so did I, you know. And uh, eventually um, I found that I could put some information together in a photograph. I wasn't saying it that way in those days. When did you decide to actively pursue art as your central occupation? Uh, I never made that decision. If anybody ever makes it as a decision, it's a mistake. It has to happen. It has to happen and, and you have to become proficient at it before you realize that, that the, uh, the burden of learning is very great if you, uh, if you realize that you're learning it. But if you don't realize that you're learning it, uh, it's amazing what can happen. Well, perhaps that's the sort of thing that happened to you in the mid-1930s when you were in Los Angeles and walking through another museum or library, I believe, and you came across some musical compositions and came up with a rather exciting notion that relates to best music being the best design. I wonder if you can explain that to us. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> what happened there is that that was the first time that I had had the chance to see uh, a large selection of, of musical scores and also uh, facsimiles of, of original work. And uh, I had often uh, thought, you know, that it, it might be interesting to have a chance like that. And so I made good use of it and, uh, and I found in a very short time, uh, there was no question in my mind that, and I was uh, convinced as I am today that the best musicians have the best looking scores. If the best musicians, as you say, have the best looking scores, is the corollary to that that the best photographers have the best looking negatives? Uh, I still don't think that it is possible to, to say what the 
a good negative should look like. A really good negative is something that produces something different that never quite happened before. And consequently, it will have a complexion that, that you cannot possibly imagine, and that is its, its uh, sense of reality. Most photographers number their work in the thousands. And you, of course, count your photographs in the hundreds. In addition to which, uh, of some, some of your pictures, you've made only two or three copies from a single negative, and sometimes the copies are not the same. I assume that is what you are telling us now, the fact that you think that all prints from the same negative should not look alike. It's, it's, it's actually uh, literally difficult to make them alike. You know? and, the, and, and then the pursuit of this handicap, of this difficulty, is what gets a lot of people in trouble. Because uh, if you pursue, you know, uh, let's, put it this, <laughs> let's put it in a rather nasty way. Suppose you hunt a deer down to death, a deer, all right? And you shoot this animal, you know, after it's exhausted, what have you, what have you done? So the, impo the important thing is not to get involved in, 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 in it that way. What are the advantages for you in working the way that you do? In having the kind of limited output that you have chosen to have? Well, any, any time that you take to repeat is a time taken from something else. And it isn't that I'm trying to be so parsimonious in, in, uh, part, in, you know, in, in the way I apportion time, because I, I, I'm a, actually a very lazy person, and I don't intend to be an efficient person. Because efficiency is the undoing of all possible pleasure. What makes a well-made photograph for you? Well, it certainly has to, show, has to bring something uh, that uh, no other photograph has brought before. And the, and the, uh, this, the, the, uh, the magnitude of the gain or the advantages of how much newness uh, occurs is not a question of, 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 of quantity. It's just a tiny step. Early on, you met Stieglitz and O'Keefe and Weston. Were they supportive of you and your work and your ideas? Well, sometimes, uh, at, at times, I met some of these people, uh, you know, we weren't all that well acquainted to start with. But they were, they were people basically supportive of what was brought to them with some understanding and, uh, and, uh, and uh, that was not making a circus out of foolishness. I was under the impression that Edward Weston, after you met him in the mid-1930s, became a close friend of yours and actually was one of the people who, after first meeting and visiting with him, caused you to become more interested and involved with photography. Is that accurate? It was unavoidable to have great respect for what Edward Weston, for instance, had. But to have great respect for something does not mean you want to go and multiply what somebody already has laid as an egg beautifully somewhere in the corner because that, you know, a good hand does not lay the same egg over again. So uh, the question uh, really is to appreciate the quality of not withholding in a person's work and in any event that we see, you know, not, you can leave the person situation out, actually. And, uh, and then uh, it is possible to, to uh, see other things. Well, your work is filled with experiment, experimentation and new techniques from its earliest beginnings. Along about 1937, for about a 10-year period, you made paintings and photographs that were quite independent of each other. And in the midpoint of that period, your work had taken an important stylistic change, a break, when you started working with what has been called horizonless landscapes where it was not easy or possible to identify a site or a place. What was your intent with those horizonless landscape photographs? Well, i tell you the truth. I got to in, into it very simply. Uh, for one thing, there's very little in the Arizona sky. You know, the, the 
usually not, mm -hmm. not a trace of clouds. And in those days, there wasn't a trace of smog. You know? And uh, so what, what would I do? Uh, have, have, a, have a rocky landscape and then have a strip of sky over it? Well, I, I tried try to accommodate myself to that thought and thought that maybe uh, something could be done that way. But then I found that these, these very plain skies show streaks. And these streaks are, are, the, are, are, are problems that the Eastman film has. And it's not just Eastman film has, other films have. There is a lot of interpretation given to those horizonless landscapes. Your view of the desert as being in hospital to man, uh, an expression of the eternal presence of death. All sorts of people have ideas about what you had in mind. I wonder if you would tell us in your own words what your intent was and what the meaning was. The desert is a completely alive area, just like any other area in the world. And uh, anybody who thinks, uh, well, what, what happens is that you walk through a desert, and as, as, a, uh, as a newcomer, you might say, you tend to, to see things that time is left there, a few bones, you know, a few remains. And the only reason that, that the bones are still there is because the climate's very good, which means that it is really a friendly climate, you know? In a friendly climate, the bones will survive longer. See? You know, around these parts, nothing will survive very long. <laughs> in, those, in those terms, yeah. All right, but to go, go on a little bit to make, to make it uh, a, a continuum in this thing. So uh, you begin to realize that the, uh, the ecology, uh, and in those days, the word ecology was, was uh, very scarce. Very few people knew it or used it and so forth. But you, begin, you realize that this is a very complex system unto itself. And, and uh, so, you, so you start working with what's there. And don't wish to make it look like the countryside of France or, or, or Great Britain, you know, these beautiful uh, uh, trees and, 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 and or, or, or think of the tropics. You know, that was just the opposite from where I had been. You know. Along about that same period, you began a series of photographs of unusual things. I'm thinking of those photographs of chicken heads and entrails and the contents of a package that was brought to you by a surgeon friend. Much of that material has been described as macabre or difficult for many people to either comprehend or deal with. I wonder if you would tell us what captivated you in that subject matter that caused you to photograph it in the first place. Talking about 1940-ish now, 1939. Well, uh, it's uh, one, you know, these, uh, the, the, again, things like that are not made as decisions. Things become available, you know, and, 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 and so you make a few moves. But the, uh, this could be, uh, could, could possibly be uh, uh, related back to the characterization of the desert and the things that I d did do in the desert. Well, the things that, that were, just as we've been describing the desert there as, as being dry, you know, and things disappearing, you know, everything. So everything there, let us say, a biology there exists in, t in terms of bones. But it would seem to me that parts of chickens are one of the few things that are always available. Why did you choose to do that series at that point in time? They're, they're, not, they're not always a, a available. People have not done them. And so apparently they were not uh, available. Uh, what, was, uh, what has been done a great deal and uh, is that people have photographed uh, the interior of, of, uh, of uh, butcher shops in the old-fashioned sense of abattoirs, you know, where mm -hmm. animals are actually killed in, in sequences and things like that. I mean, I have I've never been interested in the, in the disposing of life. If, if, uh, if I come along and something still looks interesting, and, and the, what, no matter what the stage is, you know, I will consider it. Some of those photos had a shocking effect and created a sense of unease in some of the viewers. Is that what you intended to create? No, uh, on the contrary. It is much more the sense of, of, uh, of life. 
because uh, we can't say that in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, as people became interested in, in, uh, in the biological structure, that that was done to shock anyone in particular. You know, it's, uh, you don't have to go and look for people to, to shock. They're people being naturally shocked by themselves every day. All they have to do is just turn on the lights and look at themselves and they're shocked. One of your pursuits led you to, I guess, create, invent synthetic cameraless negatives where you had camera-free prints. How do you do that? Uh, cameraless negatives uh, uh, came about for a number of reasons because once in a while one sees uh, things on a piece of film or, or on, on a piece of glass, you know, the roofing of a of the roof or a few sheets on a, on a, on a greenhouse, you know, and you, and you know you could print that on a piece of paper and maybe it would be interesting. But I, after a little bit of uh, experimenting along that line like that, I found, I found that it was really uninteresting to, uh, to do these things in the, in, uh, in the way nature had done them. Uh, you know, nature gives these things a certain size of scales, marks, you know, and, uh, your textures and so on. And uh, what I began to see was the possibility of doing things in, in a way so that, uh, so that you could get uh, very tight, small negatives that would open up and in, and in opening up would, would, uh, would have, uh, as they began to show the possibilities of having uh, uh, much finer possibilities of definition than silver emulsions, you know. And uh, so, so very, very gradually I, I was uh, led to realize that there are very unpredictable ways, it, so, so it seems at first, you know, to, to make these chancy things. But after a while, one realizes that, it, that, you, you know, with, that you have learned to, wa to walk some sort of path between all kinds of chances that you're taking and not taking. And, and so you, you do develop a rationale, and, and the rationale is simply to, to, uh, to work with what happens and uh, to accept a much wider range than we are accustomed to see in the world standing around us. And, What's uh, the specific process that you used and how you modified this negative in the year darker? Uh, the first, I think the first that I did was some, uh, I was working with, uh, with black pigment of some sort and, I, and I, I got some fingerprints on a piece of plaster and I realized how unbelievably fine this image of this fingerprint was, and so I, I got to playing with that, and that led to some things. So, so there's a, there is a paint you can make emulsions or or thin coats of paint that you can apply on, on glass or to glass or cellophane and uh, various transparent parent media, and. Uh, then there are, there are things that can be done that are much more mysterious in a way. They can be done by making, say, drawings with, uh, on, with pencil or with just, just the, in a, in a, you know, uh, on, on, on aluminum foil. You put aluminum foil on a cushion, on a slight cushion of cellophane, so it isn't just a hard piece of glass next mm -hmm. to it. And you draw with a pencil on it, and this makes, it embeds itself in it. And so you, you have an embedded drawing in this thing and if you smoke this and then transfer this to a piece smoke of glass it. smoke it over a candle and transfer this to a piece of glass you you, you get a, uh, a, a very deposit you know of this uh, soot but it must be very small although this is very small and and then you, then you begin to realize that if you do this thing with observe, observing certain care that the uh, the uh, enlarging possibilities of these very small structures are fantastic, absolutely fantastic. So you use yeah. an enlarger yeah. then to create yet yes. another yes. Yeah. transformation. So, so this has been rather interesting in that uh, one thing that photography has taught me and has, I'm sure has taught a lot of other people is the, the problem is how to size a thing, you know, certain photographs or any photograph or any drawing has a size at which, at which it is most effective. If you make it a little larger, a little smaller, it's not right for, 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 for its, it does, does not display uh, its logic sufficiently in, our, in terms of our perception. So you, so you learn to make things to suit 
the size in which techniques want to reveal their state of affairs, want to reveal their structures. How expected is the unexpected in your work? Uh, on, on, on good days, very high. Yeah. I was hoping that there's some unexpected will come. The unexpected is, 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 is everywhere around us. The only thing is, we, are, we, are, we tend to, to, uh, to look in terms of how we have done it yesterday. Because uh, maybe we did something that worked a little bit better yesterday, and we happen to remember the order of such procedures. When you were talking before about taste buds, I was thinking how expansive your palate is, and then I went from palate to palate and realized that, among other things, you were also a notable chef. And at one point, you made a rather odd couple with Aaron Siskind when you lived with him in Chicago, and you did the cooking. What were the circumstances of that arrangement? Well, it, it got it was it was fine and for me, but it also was very good for Aaron. Aaron got to eat much better food than he was <laughs> eating, and it was good for his health. You know, how was it for his photography or yours? Well, eventually, it even did some good to his photography because at that time, he wouldn't listen to some of the things I said. You know, for example. Well, I mean, certain ways of treating a print, in certain ways of handling densities, reducing, and and. and and taking care of edges and margins and things like that. He says, Fred, you, you know, one can do without these things, you know, you know. But I notice he does them very, very carefully now, you know. Do you remind him of that? Yeah. Uh, I, I, all I say to him is, Aaron, you know, your print these days looks so nice. You know? <laughs> and how does he reply? Oh, uh, he grins, you know. Perhaps you might help us unravel some mysteries. The titles of your pictures are rich and literary and elusive, but many of them are enigmatic. You might help us solve some of the more perplexing ones. Tell us how Venus, Jupiter, and Mars came about. Well, uh, if you look at that picture pretty soon, you realize that this is a fabulous triangle there, you know? And it's a very, it was a very ancient standing. You know, the Greeks had these problems, and the gods fought among themselves over the, the tidbits and morsels, you know, going around. So, so here, uh, obviously, uh, Jupiter, was the one stronger, more in possession of this goddess already. Huh? But here was this other guy moving in. Huh? So obviously his name was War, Mars, you know? And it would be Jupiter. Yeah, yeah. And how about Livia? And Venus. Well, that happens to be her name. And it was a young child that you knew? Yes. Uh -huh. And coyotes? Well, uh, where did you discover? Uh, I mean, did you arrange that? Well, no, I mean, uh, uh, the things, the way th things are brought to us usually are much more complex than we could arrange them in ourselves. Uh, let, let me give you an example. If we took, it doesn't have to be five pebbles, but if we took five pebbles, anybody can, can could do this arrangement. And, and let us say that they're approximately this size, you know, just, just a little bit larger than, than large dice, you know. An irregular shape. Now, if we played, if we had a, uh, played a game here, you know, a number of throws, you know, we would find that we could endlessly continue to get interesting arrangements. Every time that we just take a, a, a throw with these uh, uh, stones, we would get a combination of relationship to each other and orientation that we could not anywhere approach by doing ourselves. In other words. Uh, the forces of nature are constantly at work for us. What are you working on now? I like maybe a few other things to happen with, uh, with this te technique of cutting paper. How and, do you do uh, that? And uh, they're large sheets of paper, and uh, they're laid on a on a on a board, and with a knife, very very freely, shapes are cut into it. The only thing is that you have to watch is not to cut your shape out too completely or they will fall out as you as you as you too suspend heavy. it yeah mm -hmm. so uh, i want to figure out a, a few more ways of, of uh, i think i, I want to extend the complexity of this yeah. did you ever expect your life to unfold the way it has i i'm not, I'm not quite even understand how it's unfolded up to now you know and uh 
it, uh, if there is another day, uh, very likely you'll be a little different. I'm going to help it to be a little different if I can. What do you think would have happened if you stayed with painting rather than photography? Uh, my comprehension of, of uh, an interest in visual logic, you know, would have been much uh, weaker than, than it is now. I mean, that photography is just, is just a tremendous teacher. You know, you really see, you see uh, fine things. You see, when you photograph, and you learn to photograph very well, you know, you really spend a lifetime photographing very well, and I mean well, then you get what you wanted, and then you get something that you didn't know you, uh, you were going to get with it, you see. So you have to work to teach yourself to do what you want to do. And this turns out, of course, to be an illusion, because the only thing that's really worthwhile is what you didn't know. Well, thank you, Frederick Summer, for occupying this position tonight. We enjoyed very much your no. sharing so freely your ideas with us. And thank you, audience, for coming, too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Visions and Images, American Photographers on Photography.